Well, if you ever go somewhere new, you're going to need a map. And it might be a, a paper map or the maps that are stored in your GPS. The maps stored in your GPS are more complete. They get updated more often. But the thing that I don't like about them is you can only see like a half mile ahead of you at the time. So whenever I'm going somewhere besides the GPS, which can be very helpful, I usually take a look at a map to get an idea of the overall route of how I'm going to uh, be going. But, you know, the truth is, is that maps are not the roads themselves, right? It's a facsimile of the road. It's, a, it's an image of the road. And uh, it's only an approximation of the road. And um, they're not always accurate, right? Have you found that, whether they're paper maps or your GPS? Um, some time ago, I was, I was driving somewhere and had an idea of where I was going, but I'd never been there before, so I'm, I'm driving down this road that it took me on, and I got the alert, you know, in three quarters of a mile, turn left on such and such a road. So I mentally mark my odometer, and I come up, as I, as I come up, I, it's a wooded area, and I uh, look at it, and I, and I don't see any road. Now there's a road on the other side that has that same name, but that's not the direction that I'm going. And I drive by, slow down a bit, and I'm looking. There's, there's no road there. And I head on past, and after a little ways, my GPS says, continue driving for five miles and make a left. And I thought, oh, great, this is going to take me an alternate route. Well, it didn't take very long because, you know, the GPS doesn't tell you everything that's coming. It just tells you what the next thing to do is. So I made a left, and it soon became evident to me that what it was doing was turning me around to get back onto the road, and it told me, drive for five miles and make a right onto the road. So I drove and got the alert in three quarters of a mile, make a right. And I mentally marked my odometer and slowed down as I looked. There's trees there. There's no road. Um, there's a road coming out the other side that has that name, but no road over here by that name. And I know I have to go in that direction. And, you know, my GPS says make a right, which if I did, I would crash into trees. So I just continued to drive. And after, a, well, it said in, in three miles, turn left. Well, I know where this is going. It's going to have me turn around and come back the other way. So up a ways, maybe I get a mile or so up. I see a road on the right, and I take it. When I do, I look down on my GPS, and my GPS says, I'm in the woods. There's no road there. I'm off the map. Has that ever happened to you? I'm off the map. I'm driving through the woods. So I've got an idea of the general direction that I'm going, but I really have no idea where I am. And I've got to navigate my way to where I'm going, but I've got no map for doing that, so I've got to pay attention to some of the features along the road to figure out to get where I'm going, or hopefully will. Well, we've been looking at the book of 1 Corinthians, and today we come to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, and I'm going to read the first 25 verses to you. This is God's word through the Apostle Paul, to the church at Corinth, and the word of God by the Holy Spirit to us. Follow the way of love and especially desire spiritual gifts, especially the gift of prophecy. For anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God. Indeed, no one understands him. He utters mysteries with his spirit. But everyone who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening, encouragement, and comfort. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. I would like every one of you to speak in tongues, but I would rather have you prophesy. He who prophesies is greater than one who speaks in tongues, unless he interprets so that the church may be edified. Now, brothers, if I come to you and speak in tongues, what good will I be to you unless I bring you some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or word of instruction? Even in the case of lifeless things that make sounds, such as the flute or harp, how will anyone know what tune is being played unless there is a distinction in the notes? 
Again, if the trumpet does not sound a clear call, who will get ready for battle? So it is with you, unless you speak intelligible words with your tongue, how will anyone know what you are saying? You will just be speaking into the air. Undoubtedly, there are all sorts of languages in the world, yet none of them is without meaning. If then I do not grasp the meaning of what someone is saying, I am a foreigner to the speaker, and he is a foreigner to me. So it is with you. Since you are eager to have spiritual gifts, try to excel in gifts that build up the church. For this reason, anyone who speaks in a tongue should pray that he may interpret what he says. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. So what shall I do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will also pray with my mind. I will sing with my spirit, but I will also sing with my mind. If you are praising God with your spirit, how can one who finds himself among those who do not understand say amen to your thanksgiving, since he does not know what you're saying? You may be giving thanks well enough, but the other man is not edified. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you, but in the church I would rather speak five intelligible words to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. Brothers, stop thinking like children. In regard to evil, be infants, but in your thinking, be adults. In the law it is written, though through men of strange tongues and through the lips of foreigners I will speak to this people, but even then they will not listen to me, says the Lord. Tongues, then, are a sign not for believers, but for unbelievers. Prophecy, however, is for believers, not for unbelievers. So if the whole church comes together and everyone speaks in tongues, and some who do not understand or some believers come in, some unbelievers come in, will they not say that you are out of your mind? But if an unbeliever or someone who does not understand comes in while everybody is prophesying, he will be convinced by all that he is a sinner and will be judged by all, and the secrets of his heart will be laid bare. So he will fall down and worship God, exclaiming, God is really among you. If, Father, we pray that you would uh, lead us through this, your word, which you've given to us today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Theology, as I've said before, is the human echo of the divine voice. It's essentially a map so that we can get the lay of the land. It's a summary and a picture of what God's word says. I don't know if there's anybody here, I don't think so, that would say they've got this whole book memorized. Is there anybody? But even if you did memorize uh, large pieces of the book, you can't hold it all in your head at the same time time. And so we've got theology. Now, theology is not God's word itself. It's a map. And it tries to connect the points together to get us on the right route. It's not always successful. And so today we come to this vexed question of tongues at the church in Corinth. Now, I say a vexed question because I've never found a theology dealing with this passage that I'm satisfied with. I've got Pentecostal friends who have a particular theological map when it comes to this passage. Um, and when they lay out what they think, well, it seems to make sense, but when I go back and I look at this passage, they are missing data points. And I've read Reformed theologians on this issue. I like their maps better. But when I go back and actually read the text, if I'm honest, I have to admit that their maps don't line up with everything that Paul says here. All the maps have failed me. Now, I don't know. I've been looking at the maps for about 30 years now, and maybe there's a map I've missed, and maybe there's one out there somewhere, but I haven't found one. But when my GPS failed me on my trip and I was off the map, the only thing I could do was to look very carefully at the road to figure out where I was to make my way to my destination. So let's look very carefully at what Paul sa says. Uh, we can make out some observations. And, and if we can figure out the destination to which he's leading us. So 
Let's start with some observations about the landscape. Where are we? The word that Paul uses here um, for tongue most often refers just simply to language, to a particular language. In other words, if I were reading along and I I came across that word in the original language, had no other context, I would think that it was referring to a language. We speak that way poetically today. We might speak of the English tongue or the German tongue. And, And we find the word used that way in the Bible as well. In Revelation chapter 5 and verse 9, uh, we read, You ransom people for God, speaking of Jesus, to Jesus. You ransom people for God from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. Some of your translations, if you look that up, will say uh, every tribe and language and people and nation because that's what it's referring to, a language. And so if there's no other context, that word tongue refers simply to a language. So let's make that observation. There's a data point. So the second one. The practice that Paul addresses at the church of Corinth was a proprietary practice. You know what I mean by that? They, they were the only ones doing it. What was happening at Corinth we read about nowhere else in the Bible. We don't see it happening in the Old Testament. It doesn't happen in the Gospels. Uh, Paul doesn't address it at all when he speaks to other churches, writes letters to other churches, don't see it in the writings of Peter or John or James. And you know, those of you who are perceptive and who know your Bibles are going to be saying, well, but what about the book of Acts? Don't we find it there? We see it in Acts chapter 2, and we see it in chapter 10 and 19 as well. And, uh, and, and, and Luke speaks there about people speaking in tongues. But what was happening at uh, Corinth is very different than what was happening in the book of Acts. In fact, what was happening at Corinth was the exact opposite of what happened in the book of Acts. Let me read to you from Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. And there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And when they heard this sound, the crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? How is it then that each of us hears them in his own native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, Cretans, Arabs, we all hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. You see the difference? They're they're two different phenomenon. What Luke speaks about in this phenomenon, when people speak, everybody's able to understand them. What Paul is addressing in 1 Corinthians, nobody's able to understand them. It's the exact opposite phenomenon. And so what we have, what Luke speaks about, is kind of like a reversal of the curse at Babel where languages were confused. But here we have people essentially babbling. Nobody can understand them. So this phenomenon here that Paul calls tongues as practiced at Corinth was different than the tongues that Luke records in the book of Acts. Uh, It was proprietary. And it seems that the church at Corinth had a number of proprietary or kind of odd practices. Um, One particular comes to mind. Paul will mention it in the next chapter, in chapter 15. He's talking about the resurrection of the dead. And in verse 29, he says, Now if there is no resurrection, 
what will those who are baptized, what will those do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, then why are people baptized for them? Do you know what Paul's talking about there? Neither do I. And uh, commentators will guess and they will speculate, but no one knows what they're doing. It's not a practice that's mentioned in the New Testament. It's not explained anywhere. It's nothing that's contemplated in the early church. It's frankly weird. It's significant to note here that Paul doesn't take them to task for these proprietary practices. In verses uh, 39 and 40 of chapter 14, he says to them, I guess some of them there, do not forbid speaking in tongues, but everything should be done decently and in order. Now, you know, we Presbyterians like that decently and in order thing. That fits our map. I'm not too crazy about the don't forbid the speaking in tongues thing. That doesn't, for, that doesn't fit our map. Uh, Paul doesn't tell them don't be baptized on behalf of the dead, but he uses their proprietary practice, their strange practice, a- as an argument against the denial that some of them were making of the resurrection that was coming. And what's significant to note here as we come in in the church at Corinth is that Paul does not try to solve all their issues. He addresses the big ones, knowing that if the big issues are taken care of, the little ones often take care of themselves. When I was driving along without a map, I had to make observations about the actual road that I was driving on to to try to find my way back to a route that would get me to my destination. We step back and we make some observations about the things that Paul is actually saying here. I think we can get to our destination without getting lost in the woods. So let me draw some conclusions here. The first is to just admit right off the bat that what Paul says doesn't fit with my map. In fact, what Paul says doesn't fit with any map that I've been able to find so far. And so Paul says things like this. These are the things that don't fit my map. Verse 5 of chapter 14. I would like every one of you to speak in tongues. In verse 18, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. What does Paul mean by that? Is that an approval? Is he saying, I do the same thing that you do? Um, Or or is it some kind of concession or coming alongside of them? Uh, We know from the New Testament that Paul spoke in Aramaic. He spoke in Greek. He could read Hebrew. If he appealed to Caesar, well, he wasn't going to be pleading his case before Caesar in either Aramaic or Greek. And some people conclude that Paul knew Latin as well. It's probably best not to use unique proprietary practices from Corinth as a template for what we're to do in church. That's probably not a good idea. Now, if Corinth was a church that was a model of spiritual maturity, if it was a church which, when we looked at, you know, Paul said, uh, hey, really, I've only got nothing but praise for you here. I'm just writing this letter so that when later people read it, they'll know how you're to behave. And then they had these kind of odd proprietary practices. We might say, you know, if these guys are so far ahead in their spiritual walk and spiritual growth, and they also do these odd things, maybe we should be looking at those odd things. But if you paid attention to the book of 1 Corinthians, that's not the case. I can't think of a, of a church that is in more trouble in the New Testament that Paul writes to than Corinth. And it would seem strange to uh, emulate the proprietary, peculiar practices of a church that has trouble. We're guessing at what this phenomenon was at Corinth, um, as we'd be guessing what 
Paul was talking about when he spoke of those being baptized for the dead. Um, Since the late 1700s, there have been uh, Christians who have purported to speak in tongues. You can find uh, people today who will purport to speak in tongues. Is that what they were doing at Corinth? I have no idea. There are no audio recordings. I don't know what they were doing. So we'd be guessing. It's clear enough that what they were doing was something that was unintelligible. Paul says things like this in verse 2, no one understands him. In verse 4, he edifies himself rather than the church. In verse 6, if I come speaking in tongues, what good will I be to you? In verse 9, unless you speak intelligible words, how will anyone know what you are saying? In verse 14, Paul says that what they were doing rendered their minds unfruitful. In verse 17, he says others are not edified or built up. In verse 23, he warns that outsiders will conclude that they are insane. And in verse 20, he says, stop thinking like children. In regard to evil, be infants, but in your thinking, be adults. And I think those words are significant because he's just spoken in chapter 13, immediately before this, and what he said immediately before this about love. He said, when I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put childish ways behind me, Stop thinking like children. So while not forbidding them to do what it was that they were doing, it seems clear enough that Paul was discouraging them from doing that. In verses uh, 3 and 4, he says, Everyone who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening and encouragement and comfort, he who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. He who prophesies, who teaches, edifies the church. In verse 9, he says, unless you speak intelligible words, you're just speaking into the air. And, and what Paul indicates to them throughout this whole a chapter that's kind of woody, there's not a good map for it, but that they've missed the point of whatever gifts that they have or exercise. In verse 12, he says, since you're eager to have spiritual gifts, try to excel in those gifts that build up the church. In verse 19, he says, I would rather speak five intelligible words of instruction than 10,000 words in a tongue. In verse 26, he says, everything is that's done should be done for the strengthening of the church. Or in other words, as Elder Tim read this morning, don't look out for your own interests, look out for the interests of others. So where are we when we emerge from the other side of the woods of this chapter? You know, we can look at the overarching problem of the church at Corinth, and that is that they had lost sight of the kingdom of God. And they did that, we've seen throughout the whole letter, uh, in, 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 in a very particular way, that they had become self-focused, self-seeking, self-gratifying, self-promoting. And that fact had hindered their ability to love. Love is the mark par excellence of the disciples of Jesus. Everyone you will know will know that you are my disciples, Jesus said, if you love one another. But it's impossible to love when our thoughts are turned inward. It's impossible to love when our focus is upon ourselves. And, and Paul, in what he says to them here, demonstrates the kind of love that he calls them to walk in. I, I get the impression as I read chapter 14 that, that Paul was less than enthusiastic about their self-edifying modes of speaking here. 
I'm pretty sure he wasn't crazy about their baptizing for the dead either. But love, as he told us previously, is patient. And people in the church are persons to be loved and guided and helped and encouraged, not projects to be fixed. It probably bears uh, telling in some of our modern churches today. People are not projects to be fixed. They're persons to be loved, guided, and helped to growth. And Paul, as we see through the book of 1 Corinthians, is keen to correct the big things, but he allows them time and room to grow out of the little things. And in that, he displays the same attitude that was in Christ Jesus. He doesn't crush them or beat them, but he nurtures them. You know, we're told of uh, Jesus in Isaiah 42, 3, that he doesn't break the bruised reed. He doesn't snuff out the smoldering wick. And so Paul comes, and as he deals gently with the Corinthians, his attitude is not, you know, uh, Corinthians, I planted this church, and you're making me look bad. Get it right or get out. But he's patient with them. As we take the road through this woody area of 1 Corinthians 14 that's, that's off the maps, let's understand the road that we are trying to get to, the road that we're on. In 1928, there was a guy by the name of uh, Don McCrossan. There's some debate whether he wrote the song or just copyrighted it, but the most famous recording of it was done by Elvis Presley. It was a song called On the Jericho Road. Any of you who are uh, older than 50 might remember that song. On the Jericho Road. You remember the words to it? On the, on the Jericho Road, there's room for just two. No more and no less, just Jesus and you. You know, that's, I hate that song. I hate that song. Because it is the lie that infected the Corinthian church. It's not just about me and Jesus. Jesus did not die to save just you. And the work that he did on the cross for you is not his only work. He sent his Holy Spirit to do his work in you and to do his work through you to others. And that requires love, being patient with one another, being kind to one another, being not easily flustered or angered. Love is is not self-seeking, and Paul wasn't, but the Corinthians were. The whole church was seething with self-promotion and self-seeking. And they were missing the fact that there's, that there's not room for just two. In fact, the success of my spiritual journey is bound together with you succeeding in your spiritual journey. And your spiritual journey is bound together with me succeeding in mine. Now the terrain here in 1 Corinthians 14 is, is a woody terrain. But the destination is clear. That destination is away from the self-deception of self-importance, self-seeking, and self-promotion. It's a destination that, re that leads us to the realization that God's plan is to have for himself a great multitude, as Paul said in chapter 12 here, a body of interconnected, interdependent individuals. The way here is woody, but the, the destination is clear. And Paul's great vision for the church at Corinth, I think for the church as a whole, was well reflected in the book, The Weight of Glory by C.S. Lewis. Lewis writes there, 
He's, he's thinking here of the goal that God has for us in Christ, to be conformed to the image of Christ, to share in his glory, uh, as those who will judge angels, as Paul says elsewhere. And so Lewis writes, it's a serious thing to live in a society of possible gods and goddesses. To remember that the dullest, most uninteresting person you talk to may one day be a creature which, if you saw it now, you would be strongly tempted to worship. Or else a horror and a corruption, such as you now meet, if at all, only in a nightmare. And all day long we are, in some degree, helping each other to one or the other of these destinations. So let everything be done in love with the goal of building one another up in Christ. And you know, if we, if we do that, that big thing, the little things that trouble us as individuals and as a church will take care of themselves. Father, we give you thanks uh, for your word. Lord, I'm reminded of uh, words of the Apostle Peter in his second letter. He says of Paul that he, that he writes with the same goal, that, that, that there are some things that Paul writes uh, that are hard to understand, which, which people can distort and twist. And, and so, Lord... Uh, Help us through thorny passages like this and help us to see the clear road to which it's bringing us. We don't know all of the circumstances at Corinth, but, but by your grace, if we look at the lay of the land, we can see the big picture. And help us, Father, to take care of the big things. Through Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen.